Thank you so much. Nico Pelled has flown to be with us this morning, and it is just such an incredible honor. I've read his books. I follow his podcast. I um, just really admire his yes. voice in this struggle. And um, when, when we first thought about the Holy Land Foundation as recipient for this award, um, I thought I'd email Miko's, Miko, I had his email from when he last spoke about four years ago here at the church. I sent out the email, the phone rings. And it just like, that was just a, a moving moment when Miko realized that the, this connection is, is uh, just such a strong one. Um, and we are just so glad that he is with us because of the book that he wrote. We have a few copies. There were some more that we don't think have arrived, but, um, but we'd love to get this book out and whatever copies he doesn't sell, we're gonna, we're gonna purchase and have for sale here. Uh, we are determined to get this story out and figure out how we can be part of freeing these men and having them back with their family. We think about that, especially during this time when families need to be together and, um, and we, want, we want that to happen sooner than later and we believe that it can happen because, you know, it's just like, it's just a glaring miscarriage of justice. So let's welcome Miko Pilled. Thank you so much, Miko. Thank you, Dean. Thanks for that. And uh, thank you all for being here this morning, afternoon. Um, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in this space again. This is really, um, it's a special space. It feels really good to be here. It's like all the right books, the right people, the, the right energy. And um, so like Dean was saying, he sent me an email um, telling me that uh, the church wants to give the award to um, the second Manzetti Award to the Herland Foundation. And uh, I thought nothing could be more appropriate. When I heard, first heard about the Holland Foundation, it was 2012. My book, The General Senate, just, uh, had just come out. And I was speaking in Dallas and uh, at the university. And right after I, I finished speaking, a bunch of young students came up to me and started telling me the story. And these students were connected, related to, to the guys, to the guys in jail, the Holland Five. And um, what I what I felt, what I thought when I heard the story for the first time, was the same as the reaction that I got from people over the years as I've been telling them the story. Just complete disbelief. Complete, complete disbelief. The only people that were not surprised by what had happened were people of color in this country. To them, the story makes perfect sense because that's been their experience. And I realized the divide that exists between the you know, people of color and, um, and people who are white in this country, there's a huge divide when it comes to the justice system as well. Um, which so, whereas our, uh, you know, the, the, the response of shock, the response of, you know, impossible, this can't be, you know, the American judicial system may have some flaws, but it's basically just and so on. This only exists if you're on the privileged side of the, of the railroad, so to speak, you know, the tracks. Um, on the other side, there was no surprise whatsoever. So I thought that was very telling. Um, so then after I heard it initially, the, you know, I started looking into it. They were sending me for more and more information. I started communicating with the, uh, with the five in their respective prisons. Has anybody here read the book, by the way? Anybody have the book? I don't want to repeat if the... <laughs> um, and so, um, and I, I found myself being exposed to incredible people. I flew to Dallas a few times to meet with the families. Wonderful people. The hospitality, the sense of, a sense of gratitude that I was doing this, that I was looking into it. And... Um, 
I was at the same time, I was also reading more and more about Sacco and Vanzetti. I knew the story of Sacco and Vanzetti. I knew it my whole life. I don't even remember how I learned about it, but I knew it. I knew I knew about it. And um, one of the things that I found striking was when the case, after they were um, uh, the verdict was given, there were support protests throughout the entire world. Hundreds of thousands of people came out to protest in Shanghai, in Tokyo, in LA, I mean, everywhere. This is the 1920s, nobody had a phone. There was no TV, you know? And the word got out and the impact was just tremendous. Here, the 21st century, and you can barely get a crowd of people to even want to listen to talk about it. You can barely get a sense of, you know, the outrage. You can't, you know, the people are not outraged. And I found that to be extremely troubling. But, you know, I decided to pursue it. I said, this is going to be my next book. This is, this is definitely worthy of a book. Number one, because I found it just, again, unbelievable. And I thought it was important to convey to people that not only they should believe it, but this is how, this is how the, the system works. Um, and there's no question in my mind whatsoever, and not just only my mind, people who'd worked with them, their lawyers, if they were not Muslims, if they were not Palestinians, they would not be in jail today. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. Not only did they not break the law, not only it wouldn't even occur to them to hurt a fly, Um, but their entire existence was about giving. Their entire existence was about giving. They felt that they were privileged, that they were able to come to America, that they were able to do well, that they had families and their family, their children were doing well and so on. And there was time to give back. And Holy Land Foundation was, that was the purpose of the Holy Land Foundation. Excuse me. But the way they did it, and, and again, I'm trying to understand, I went through all these stages trying to understand how something, how something like this can happen. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that they didn't do anything wrong. When you, when you look into the details, it's obvious that this should be a very simple case that any, you know, any young inexperienced lawyer could win. Um, you know, throw out the charges or any judge would throw out the charges because they're so absurd. And yet from trial to trial, appeal to appeal, it's like there's this wall and nobody can see beyond it. The lawyers, at first I thought, maybe they had really bad lawyers. Maybe their lawyers were incompetent. Then I met their lawyers. They're not incompetent. These are veteran lawyers, people who've done a lot of great work and continue to do great work. And they could not believe that the system could be rigged in such a way. And it's, it's so obviously. And then as they began, as the, the legal process began, as the trials were going on, it became more and more clear to the lawyers that their clients did not stand a chance. Now, I think that I mean, we, I, could, I could talk about this case, you know, for, for days and days and days. Um, but a couple of things that I find particularly important and interesting. First of all, take the disbelief, the sense of disbelief that something like this can happen. And it has happened. And uh, how do you refute that? In other words, what do you show people so they understand that not only it happened, but it can happen again and it's happened before? And the, uh, I thought the best way to do that is not for, for, the, for the information to come from me. It's not me saying this, but rather look at the trial transcripts. So I got hold of the transcripts of the, of the trials. I probably read, I don't know, 20, 25,000 pages. And you have to read the, you, ha you have to see, to read the details of the transcripts, of the court, the day-to-day -day stuff, the responses from the judges, the responses from the prosecution. 
Um, and it didn't matter how hard the lawyers tried. It didn't matter how poorly the witnesses for the prosecution, you know, were, uh, were arguing. Ralph Nader described it as they had a, they had a hanging judge. Their ju these judges were, gonna, were out to get them. The details, the facts, the legal process had, you know, was not going to stop them. And um, so I put as much, as much as I could of the transcripts in the book. Of course, you couldn't put 20,000 pages in it. But, you know, I just picked like, you know, the, 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 what, I, what I felt was, was crucial. So why did this happen? Why would the American, why would the, uh, why would the United States want to close down an operation that was so successful? An operation that people trusted, an operation that was able to connect between people throughout the world. Now, their mandate obviously was Palestine, to help Palestinians um, in need, the refugees and so on, orphans. But they also did a lot of work for other, you know, in other situations. When there was natural disasters, whether it was uh, violence, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing, things like that, they were there. They were there to help. And um, is Abdul Rahman going to be speaking? Did you get hold of him? Is this not? Is oh, okay. Um, so the and, and then the other issue that I felt was really really important is the connection to Israel, because the connection to Israel is what made this possible. There exists this infatuation in America with Israel, whether it's the, certainly the, the entire defense apparatus, they're infatuated with Israel. The military, the whole military aspect, the so-called war on terror, there's this infatuation with Israel. And the people here on the ground that work, so to speak, for the state of Israel, whether it's the Anti-Defamation League, whether it's uh, APAC, whether it's um, just individual politicians, Chuck Schumer, people like that, um, they were acting like watchdogs, like gatekeepers, if you will. And they continue to do so to this day. You know, if you open your mouth, you say something, you know, negative about Israel, of course, you're anti-Semitic. Look at the movie Farha. Has anybody here seen the movie Farha on Netflix? Boy, the Israelis are going nuts. So, um, as early as the 1990s, these groups and individuals noticed that the Holy Land Foundation is doing something unique. They're Palestinians, they're Muslims, and people are liking them and trusting them more and more. And the more they were able to portray the immense need in Palestine for the kind of work that they were doing, relief work, the more concern there was among these Zionist organizations in the U.S. And at some point, you know, a bunch of these people sat in a room and said, we got to take these guys out. It had to be that way because it was so effective and so systemic. Now, what the lawyers were telling me was very interesting. They were telling me that when uh, it was December the 4th, right, right after 9-11, just very shortly after 9-11, that they were closed down. And um, they were closed down and then they were designated as a terrorist organization. And their reaction was, well, you know, it's understandable. Them, I mean, the, the Holy Land Foundation people. They said, it's understandable. America had just gone through this terrible, terrible, terrible experience. A little panic, a little fear, you know, a little overreaction is natural. So they sued the government, which is what you do. And uh, they demanded that the assets would be available to them and to get rid of the designation as a terrorist organization. And they had no doubt that they would succeed. They had no doubt that this was going to work. They brought in, uh, you know, all the, all the testimony, all the, all the proof that was possibly, one could possibly ask for to show that the designation was wrong, to show that there's no reason uh, to freeze their asset and to show very clearly that every dime that they ever raised was accounted for. Every penny, every dime was accounted for. They, can, they know exactly where everything went and nothing went to Hamas because Hamas was the big, was the, was the devil. They were saying that they support Hamas. So they went to court 
and they showed their evidence. This is, you know, the initial, the initial trial where they sued the government. The government had a piece of paper in which there's testimony by a gentleman by the name of Muhammad Anati. Muhammad Anati uh, was the uh, head of their office in Jerusalem. He's Palestinian, lives in Jerusalem, and that was his job. And the government had a piece of paper where he was questioned by the Israelis. And at one point he says, according to this paper, at one point he says, we did show preference when we gave, whatever we gave, relief, to people who were affiliated with Hamas. Well, that's, that's troubling. So the lawyers got hold of that piece of paper, the original one, which was in Hebrew, of course, because it happened, but the Israeli police were questioning him. They had it translated, they had it notarized, which the government translation was not. And it turns out that he said the exact opposite. But they never showed any preference to anyone based on religion, based on politics, based on anything. But there it was, the piece of paper was there. So the judge decided uh, against them. So then they appealed. And the appellate court agreed with the judge's decision. And the lawyer said to me then, at that point, is that when they understood that these guys don't stand a chance. And then the indictments came down. And they were, what are they indicted for? There's no law that was broken. No laws were broken. So then the government changed their story and they said, well, no, they didn't actually give money to Hamas. They gave money to organizations that were affiliated with Hamas. They worked with local relief organizations on the ground. Mostly we're talking about Palestine. And those organizations are, are uh, somehow connected to Hamas. Okay. The government brought in, and uh, I'm sure some of you at least uh, know this, Two expert witnesses that testified anonymously. One was an officer in the Israeli intelligence, and one is an officer in the Israeli military intelligence. Anonymously. All they knew was that they had some kind of a makeup first name. And these experts were supposed to show very clearly and without any doubt that what the Oilan Foundation was doing was bad and that they were supporting terrorism. They even went so far as to say, one of these officers, to say that they can smell Hamas. They're so good, they know these things so well that they can smell Hamas. The lawyers for the defense, the lawyers for Holy Land, uh, questioned them. And that I put in the book. They didn't know anything about these organizations. They didn't know anything about who runs these organizations. They'd never been to the offices of these organizations. So for example, one of the lawyers said, well, here's a list, here's, here are all the names of the board of directors of this particular charity that's mentioned in the indictment. Which of these are known to be members of Hamas? They didn't know. So he said, okay, well, here's a list of the previous board how many of them or which one of them is affiliated with Hamas? They didn't know. So in other words, even though these supposedly expert witnesses were brought all the way from Israel as expert witnesses, they knew nothing. Of course, you gotta wonder why did they, how, how, how do you even do something like this? Bring expert witnesses from another country to testify in a court here in the United States anonymously. And how is it that a judge allowed this? How is it that a judge allowed this? Now, the connection with Israel, this is probably, that's probably like the, this is bringing these two witnesses was, you know, like the, 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 the clearest uh, evidence that there was connection to Israel. But these Zionist groups and the Zionist individuals I mentioned earlier, from the early 1990s, they began to poison you know, poison the well, poison the waters in anything that has to do with Holy Land Foundation. They put out a rumor that they 
are obviously supporting Hamas, that they're all members of the Muslim Brothers, that they're plan planning and plotting all kinds of terrible things, and that the money is coming from Holy Land Foundation. Now, the numbers don't make sense, because when you see the amount of money that they were sending and you compare that to what it would take to run such a you know, complex terrorist organization, it doesn't make sense. That was, even for that, it wasn't enough money. But um, so they said that they lied on their application uh, to become a not-for-profit organization. Then they said again, like I said, that they're all members of the Islam Muslim Brotherhood and on and on and on and on. And, on. and they, were, they, began, um, they began to... Um, tap their phones, particularly Shukri, in 1993 or 1994. And then at the trial, they brought up what was heard in these, in these uh, conversations. And as the trial was going on, and this was brought up as evidence, Shukri realized that the translation was wrong. Whoever translated these uh, conversations did it wrong. Now, Arabic has different, obviously, different dialects to different countries. Uh, within Palestine, every town, every region has a slightly different dialect. When you talk to a friend, obviously, you don't talk as though you're, you know, giving a, a lecture. And the guy either didn't know, or didn't care, or maliciously just decided to lie. But it was obvious that the translations were wrong. And when the lawyers objected, and when you know, Shukri pointed this out, nobody cared. It made no difference. So the first trial, so the, 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 when they sued the government, that ended up with them losing. First trial began and ended, and it ended with a mistrial. Uh, one of the five, Mufid Abdul Qadir, who was actually not even an operative, he was not even working for Holy Land Foundation, he would just show up and do fundraising and things like that as a volunteer. He, uh, he was found not guilty on all charges. And the prosecution decided after, uh, at the end of the trial, that they decided to poll each and every one of the jurors. And one of the jurors stood up and said, no, 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 wait, I made a mistake. I didn't mean it. And it didn't matter how much the, the defense lawyers had objected, the judge called this trial on him as well. Then a second trial came around and they changed the indictment. They made it a lot easier for the government to, uh, you know, to, 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 to argue that the case, to argue their own case against Holy Land. And then it ended up with uh, all, all of them were convicted. Now, I remember talking about this with people in Palestine that actually worked with Holy Land Foundation. And when I told them about the verdicts, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe me. 65 years? 65 years for, for doing what? Even if they say that they did what they did, 65 years is insane. Now, they gave very little money, actually. What they gave was mostly in kind. Ambulances, school supplies, clothes, food, things like that. But I think what is so troubling about this, I mean, a lot of things are troubling, but what troubles me about this the most is this connection to Israel. Is this idea that if an Israeli a security officer or intelligence officer says something, then, you know, these guys are experts and they know their business and therefore we're going to believe them. And this, we see this even now. I don't know if you saw, but Benjamin Netanyahu is the prime minister elect. He's not even in office yet. He's being interviewed by everybody. He's all over. He's all everywhere you watch. You see him interviewed. Bill Maher, uh, Joe Olstein, uh, What's his name? Uh, Peterson. He's on the networks. He, he hasn't even taken office yet. What is this infatuation with, with Israeli politicians and Israeli, this whole Israeli thing? You know? And I think the connection here is really dangerous. It's really, really dangerous. Because if you can take down, if you can take down an organization that does nothing but good and put five men 
who did nothing, who only did good and wanted to do good in, in, in federal prison for such long sentences, something here is inherently sick. Something here is it's a pathology. So I don't know if you know this, but the verdicts came down. Shukri Abu Bakr, whose daughter Nida is here, by the way, if you haven't met her yet, um, he got 65 years. Now, Shukri is a little older than me. I think he's a year or two older than I am, you know, so he's in the 60s. Hassan Ilashi, 65 years. Mufid Abdul Qadir, like I said, who had nothing to do with the organization other than coming as a volunteer to do events, got 20 years. Now remember, he was found not guilty on all charges in the first trial. 20 years in federal prison. And then Abdurrahman Oudeh, who was supposed to be here today, he was already released, um, but has COVID, so he couldn't come. And if you knew how difficult it was to get the government to allow him to travel, because they don't allow, he can't travel freely, he has to get permission to travel. He's not allowed to work. He's not allowed to open a business. You know, the man, all he can do is sit home all day. Um, he got 15 years. And uh, Muhammad al uh, who was the older of the whole group, kind of the elder, uh, got 15 years as well. And he was supposed to be released as well. And his family went to pick him up. And they said, no, 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 sorry. We're releasing him, but not you. They put him in an ICE facility because his naturalization process was interrupted during the, when the trial began. So he wasn't fully naturalized a citizen. And he sat, I think, close to a year in, a, in an ICE facility, and he was just deported to uh, Turkey. And you wonder how much more suffering do, do these people have to go through? And again, uh, the connection with Israel. Now, after this, uh, as I was working on the book, I was reading everything I could get my hands on, looking online. One of the things I found, which was eerie, the uh, website for the Israeli security agency, they were boasting, celebrating the two of their guys assisted in a case, a terrorism case, and managed to get these terrorists, these Hamas terrorists in prison in the United States. This connection is very, very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. Not only is Israel getting $3.8 billion a year of US taxpayers' money, Not only is it, you know, dangerous for people to say anything about Palestine, there's this atmosphere of kind of like a witch hunt almost. If you say Palestine in a positive way, then you're anti-Semitic. Not only are they changing the definition of anti-Semitism. I don't know if you've heard, anybody know what I'm talking about, the definition of anti-Semitism? They, they create a new definition of anti-Semitism, which makes it so if you, are, if you object to what Israel does or object like I do to Israel's existence as a political entity, then you're anti-Semitic. And now we have a court case. We have a trial in Texas. And it's all about Israel. And another thing, by the way, uh, talking about Israel, um, the Israelis sent boxes and boxes and boxes of documents which were all in Hebrew, of course, or in Arabic, as proof. And these were just things that they, they picked up, you know, as, as they were raiding different offices, uh, offices of the Palestinian Authority and so on. This, these deep ties, you know, usually when politicians talk about Israel, they talk about the, you know, the deep ties that the United States has with Israel, as though it's something, you know, inherently wonderful. It's terrible. It's terrible. Now, um, the, I, I watched the movie Farha a few days ago. If you, if you haven't watched it, did I ask, who, who's seen, anybody here seen the movie Farha already? Farha? Yeah. It's this new movie on Netflix. It's about, what, it's about, it's a story of one woman who, um, and what she experienced in Palestine in 1948, in her village. Um, and it's a very powerful movie. It's, it's, it's not for the weak at heart. It's a very powerful movie, brilliantly done. And Netflix, you know, is, is, is showing it. The Israelis are going nuts. 
They're calling to boycott Netflix. The Israeli government announced that any theater that shows the movie will be, uh, uh, funds would be held, government funds would be held from any, any theater that shows the movie or discusses the movie. Um, and again, you go, what, what is this madness? What is this madness? When uh, Amnesty International came out with their report last February, a report that's, that clearly shows that Israel is an apartheid state and has been an apartheid state from day one, Amnesty International became an organization of anti-Semites. And I was speaking to the, uh, to the head of Amnesty here in the United States, 80 congressional offices, 80 congressional offices denounced the report before it was even published. Before it was even published, before anybody read it, they had denounced it. So, you know, you, you put all this together and you have to wonder what is going on here? Why is it happening? And why are Americans paying this price of $3.8 billion? But also this, this, this uh, intervention in the judicial system, intervention in, in journalism. The FBI wants to, um, you know, investigate the killing of Shirin Abu Akhle. Well, if there's such a strong relationship between Israel and the United States, you think Israel would be welcoming that. So, of course, come. You know, we have this strong ties to the, the you know, with, with, uh, with the United States. Of course, the FBI should be welcome to come. Do you think they said that? They won't cooperate. So it's one-sided. There's nothing for Americans to gain. There's nothing for the United States to gain as a, as a country. And yet these ties, this, this you know, pathological connection to Israel is only getting stronger. Israel can get away with killing an American citizen. You can get away with killing an American citizen. It wasn't like she was in Palestine and you know, she got murdered by somebody or there was some kind of mistake or, or it was you know, a stray bullet. It was an assassination. It was an assassination, it was a sniper. And a sniper, you know, knows what, you know, what knows how to shoot a particular target, right? That's why they're snipers. She had press written all over her, besides the fact that everybody knew her. And the America has to accept it. You remember the, I don't know, anybody here remember or know the story of the USS Liberty? A US naval uh, vessel that was in international waters during the time of the 1967 uh, war, and they were bombed. They were assaulted, they were attacked by, by uh, Israeli Air Force and Navy, and there were no consequences. So you have to wonder at what point, at what point are we gonna see an end to this? At what point are Americans gonna stand up and say, what the hell is going on here? It's our money. It's a rogue state on the other side. Several, you know, reputable human rights organizations have shown clearly with very clear evidence that it is an apartheid state, that Israel is committing crimes against humanity. What else does Israel need to do? They're killing Americans. And I mean, what else do, does, do, do they need to do before Americans stand up and say, that's it, enough? And I know that's part of a bigger problem. It's part of a bigger question. When uh, Barack Obama was, you know, towards the end of his second term, there was an attempt to get him to commute their sentences. And it was an international campaign. Heads of state called him up. Nothing. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. And you think, why not? You know, it's the end of his second term. He's got nothing to, he doesn't have to win elections anymore. There's no reason for him to be afraid of, you know, the Israeli lobby. And he didn't do it. So the, the, one of the problems with the story and with the book is that uh, in writing the book is that it ends with no, nothing happy, nothing good. When the campaign to get Obama to commute their sentences was going on, one of the guys, Mufid, asked me if I thought he would do it. And it's a tricky question because here's an inmate in one of the worst prisons in America, it's, it's notorious 
Uh, Beaumont, Port Arthur is notorious. I think it's one of the, the highest murder, mur uh, murder, the murder capital of prisons in America. Um, and he, uh, so, you know, so here I am on the outside. What do I tell him? What do I tell this guy who's on the inside? But, you know, I mean, these guys are smart. It was obvious they knew very well that Obama wasn't going to do it, you know. And I think, I more than think, I, I'm, I'm absolutely positive that, like I said earlier, if they were not Palestinians, if they were not Muslims, they wouldn't be in jail. And therefore, until Palestine is free, until all Palestinian prisoners are free, they will not be free. Which in a way is scary because, you know, we don't see... We don't see the apartheid uh, state of Israel collapsing anytime soon. We don't see any solution, uh, positive solution or positive steps taken, being taken over there. So that means these guys are going to be in jail for a very long time. I mean, Mufid is 20 years, so he's already counting backwards. He's already counting the days. He's already planning what he's going to do when he comes out. So three out of the two, out of the five, will be out pretty soon. Um, but Shukri and, uh, and Hassan, 65 years. And... Um, when my first book came out, The General Sun, uh, one of the nicest things that happened to me was that Alice Walker wrote about it. She wrote the foreword. And um, one of the things she said was that this was the most hopeful book she's read about, you know, about Palestine, Israel. And uh, it's very difficult to describe hope right now, to talk about hope right now at all. Israel is now about to embark on a on a whole new on a whole new voyage, if you will, or trip, where the killing and dispossession of Palestinians is going to be a thousand times worse than it's ever been before. I know how you know how much time you've taken to examine exactly who the, the next uh, prime minister is and who are his coalition partners, but this year which was a record year in terms of how many Palestinians were killed, people are going to look back at this year as the good old days. They're going to miss this year. Because not only are the, you know, the settlers and all these you know, violent racist thugs, they, they've been getting away with murdering Palestinians anyway, but now, now they're sitting at the table. Now they're sitting in the most sensitive uh, positions in the government. One of them is going to be the Secretary for Homeland Security, which is a new, a new ministry that was created just for him, where he's going to be in charge of the police. He's going to be in charge of the, the special police unit, which is called Border Police, which uh, governs the life of Palestinians in the West Bank. And another one, that's Ben Gvir, you may have heard the name Ben Gvir. The other one, Smotrich, who's his partner, political partner, he... Um, is going to have a special position within the Ministry of Defense, again, dealing with the Palestinians. And also dealing with how quickly settlements, Israeli settlements will be approved in these highly sensitive, highly populated areas within the West Bank. So we're looking at, we're looking at you know, down the road as, at, at, at horrors that we have not seen yet, or the Palestinians have not experienced yet, and we can already see it on the ground. There's been an escalation of violence against Palestinians immediately after the elections. So these guys are now at the table. They're going to have huge budgets. They're going to be, um, you know, creating policy. And this book, in, in Justice, there, there's no really good end in sight. I mean, yes, it's wonderful that Abdurrahman is out. It's wonderful that um, the Muhammad Mizain is, is out, albeit he's, you know, he's in Turkey, not here with his family. But at least he's a free man. Um, but we still have three people in federal prison, people who are not only completely innocent, but these are the finest people you'll ever meet. And I'm not exaggerating. And so um, I, I think it's incumbent upon us. People say, so, you know, is there hope? Is there hope? Well, we're going to have to create hope. That's, you know, that story I told you about the hope and, and uh, Alice Walker. We have to create hope. It's not just sitting there and waiting one day to wake up and act. We act, if we act, then there's hope. 
if we don't act, then there's not there's nothing to be hopeful for, nothing to expect. And you know, people are busy and people are worried. Of course, Palestinians are doing everything they possibly can and above and beyond in order to free themselves and liberate their country. But there are like um, they are like prisoners, inmates in a maximum security prison. They don't have the kind of freedom to actually do something about their fate. If they resist uh, with weapons, they get killed. If they resist without weapons, they get killed. If they sit at home and just mind their own business and don't resist at all, they still get killed. Their homes are demolished. Their kids are being uh, killed and, and, and tortured and so on. So where's the happy ending here? Well, we if we want to see a happy ending, then we're going to have to organize. We're going to have to mobilize. We're going to make, have to make sure that places like this, like this space right here, which obviously on every issue is going in the right direction, is packed every single time there's an event here. And people need to come to terms with the fact that there's something very, very sick about the relationship between the U.S. and Israel. If an American president can stand up and proudly say that they're Zionist and get away with it, it's madness. It's madness. Zionism has a history now over 100 years. It's not about what the initial founders of Zionism thought or didn't think or did or didn't do. We have 100 years, over 100 years of history of Zionism. And what we see is destruction, suffering, killing, and on and on. And here, even in the United States, the entire war on terror, the entire war on terror is all about the United States following this, you know, this path that Israel has created and Israel is demanding. So I want to encourage everybody to act. Now, whether it's visiting, has anybody here been to Palestine? I'm sure some, some people have. Oh, yeah, quite a few. You know, go to Palestine. People are always worried, is it dangerous? Is it safe? Is it a good time? It is fine. Go to Palestine. I mean, I would suggest going with somebody who knows, you know, who knows Palestine. Uh, I take, you know, friends from time to time. But I mean, it's, you should go and visit Palestine. Talk to Palestinians. See for yourself, experience for yourself what they're going through. And then make sure that people understand the connection between what happened to the Holland Foundation Five, these excellent men, and what is taking, what Israel is doing in Palestine. And these guys will not be released, will not be free until Palestine is free and Palestinian political prisoners in Palestine are free. So I guess this is an invitation for everybody to do more. You know, I mean, Palestinians are paying with blood. They're paying with blood. A good friend of mine, Isa Amro, runs a really important um, uh, grassroots in the midst of the ultimate of Hebron, among the worst settlers, the worst, most racist. They'll fail me to describe just how brutal and racist these guys are. Many of them, by the way, are Americans. Many of them are Americans. They are, at their back, they have, you know, Israeli, Israeli soldiers, combat soldiers. And I don't know if my friend Isa is going to be alive tomorrow. I don't know if his son, who's 10 years old now, is going to be an orphan tomorrow. And by the same token, we don't know which young Muslim Palestinian or Pakistani or Indian or, or from any other place is going to be thrown into a, some kind of a high security prison suddenly because somebody decided to frame them and, well, the story is gone and on and on. We don't know. And it's like we don't have any control over it. So we have to take control of these things. You know, we have to, we have to, you know, get, 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 put the power back in our hands so that this story ends in a positive way. And again, the only way it's going to end a positive way is if we act so that at least, at least the lives of Palestinians and Muslims here in America are safe, are somehow guaranteed. And then the life and the safety and security of Palestinians in Palestine is safe. 
you know, uh, in 20, I'll say one more sentence. I know, uh, in, uh, yeah, last year, not this, not this, um, uh, the spring of this year, the spring of last year, there was a huge uprising in Palestine. Palestinians everywhere rose throughout the entire country, all historic Palestine, even the parts that people like to call Israel. I don't like to use that name, but even that part of the country is, uh, you know, people, Palestinians with Israeli citizenship were rising and there were hundreds of arrests and, you know, and they, have, they arrested them and they always put sec a security in the indictments because that guarantees that they'll get, you know, higher jail sentences. Um, and the Palestinians showed the world that they can do it. And they showed the world that they are all one people. And they showed the world that Palestine is one country. But they pay a heavy price. And we need to be here. We need to, we need to have their back. We need to demand that our politicians stop talking about this. You know, the code word is, you know, guaranteeing the security of Israel. Israeli security, Israeli security, Israeli security. Israel, Israel has an enormous army and there's nobody to fight. Israel has, you know, all the security it needs. But what about the security of Palestinians? We're being harassed. The children of the Holy Land Foundation Five are harassed. Certainly Palestinians are harassed night and day, whether they're activists or not activists. And harassed is a soft word to describe what's happening. So in a way, this case should be a wake up call for everyone. And that's why I wrote the book in the hopes that somehow we can break that glass ceiling, which is, you know, caps who's willing to talk, who's willing to listen and who's willing to act on Palestine. It hasn't happened yet, unfortunately, but hopefully, you know, it'll happen. And tying it back to Satan Manzetti, I think it was Michael Dukakis who pardoned them, right? There's a, a copy of the pardon. Oh, there right you go. Well, they're already dead. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for pardoning them. Where were you when they needed it? Where are we when the Holy Land Foundation needs us? After Shina Bakli was murdered, assassinated, there were some protests. Her picture was still on social media here and there. But it's old news. Who's going to protect the next one? The next Palestinian journalist, the next Palestinian activist, the next Palestinian kid who's just walking to school. It's gotta be us. It really has to be us. So once again, I'm, I, I can't tell you how, how moved I am by this, this um, what's going on here uh, today and yesterday, and by the fact that Holy Land is finally receiving um, some recognition for their hard work and for the good things they did. I think the parole officer was shocked. The dean wrote a letter to explain to the parole officer what this is about, and he knows Abdul Rahman, you know, a guy who was convicted on terrorism charges. Suddenly, he's getting an award for humanitarian work for doing good, you know, all these good things. So I'm sure the probation officer was, you know, confused. But let's not wait until everybody's dead. Let's not wait a hundred years. Let's do it now. Okay. Thank you very much.